Hi, my name is Connor Delaney. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of MD Insight. And I'm excited to be here today with Dr. John Vargo, uh, who's a gastroenterologist, but also is director of our endoscopy program for Cleveland Clinic, which is some 100,000 scopes yeah. this year. So it's a, a reasonably big program. And so maybe John, kick off with talking a little bit about your role and responsibilities and, and some of the group that you're running. Thanks, Connor. Um, well, I, I like to use the example of uh, being a conductor at a symphony and what, I, what we are trying to do, Connor and I and others in the organization, is actually to get our endoscopic practice on the same sheet of music. We have, what, 24 sites of service. And, in Ohio alone, yeah. And, you know, it, it's all about our patients. Patients are first. We want to deliver uh, world-class care, but we want to also coordinate how we do this in terms of ensuring that we have a uniformity across our, our entire system or utilizing the term system is for this. And this has been a very exciting venture for us because we've been able to, co uh, to collaborate with many stakeholders across the organization to streamline our approach to how we manage our endoscopic units, uh, how do we purchase our equipment, and how do we develop product lines that will optimize patient care. Yeah, I mean, it's a really significant operation, isn't it? And the other, I think the other complexity to it that I think many people wouldn't realize is the variety and styles of the, the site, so to speak. So at main campus, you've got Q3, which is the sickest of the sick, and we've got A3, which is an outpatient site, and then we've got all of the regional sites, and it's a mix of hospitals, ambulatory surgery, and, and then you can copy and paste that down to, to Florida, and you know, Abu Dhabi has some complex stuff going on too. So how do you, um, what are your thoughts about how we kind of manage that going forward? And I, I guess I mean how we streamline the right patient to the right place, because endoscopy has become so complex, that's really important. I think uh, one, of the, one of the things is that one size does not fit all, and we have to respect the differences in our, uh, our, our, our practice environments. I think one of the things that we're looking at strategically is, is how do we develop product lines, and how do we scale them, and how do we dis, uh, uh, distribute them uh, throughout. And I think we can look at our endoscopic surgical program with uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection, uh, both foregut and hindgut. We, you know, we, uh, three or four years ago, uh, uh, physicians and leaders sat down and started putting that together. It's, it's, it's gained momentum. It's now become a, 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 a very successful referral uh, part for us. So we've seen it build uh, on the main campus. I think the next, the next challenge will be how do we scale, into, scale it into the region? And I think we're going to be able to see that. We have it now in Florida. We have it here at the main campus. And you know, the, next, the next challenge will, will be where do we put it at, 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 uh, at what site in the, in the future. Um, you know, other things that we're looking at, I mean, our interventional EUS uh, is really starting to take hold. It, it, it used to be, uh, uh, we're really in the realm of where interventional radiology was five or six years ago in terms of managing complicated hepatobiliary disorders. And it's interesting, with, the, uh, with uh, bariatric surgery, it's created a whole new genre of how we approach the, the, the uh, pancreas and the biliary system. And with some of the advanced endoscopic techniques that we have, we can uh, uh, take the patient out of the laparoscopic approach and we can do these now in our endoscopic lab and save the patient the time and morbidity and obviously deliver the same type of outcome and at, at, at the same time demonstrating high value for our, uh, for our enterprise. Yeah, I mean, it's totally transformed patient recovery, hasn't it? From, yes. uh, you know, it used to be an open heller and now it's a, an endoscopic poem, uh, which is even a whole lot better than laparoscopic surgery. So it's, it's transformed recoveries for patients. Right. I mean, uh, you know, taking the lead on your early recovery uh, uh, algorithms that you use in colorectal surgery, if you have a patient with achalasia now, we can not only do the poem, but we can do a transoral incisionist fundoplication, so you can actually do a combination of endoscopic procedures at, at, at the same setting now, and uh, uh, again, have phenomenal patient outcomes. So John, how did you pick this field? I mean, obviously it's fascinating and technically challenging and innovative, but, but what drew you to it? I had a wonderful teacher when I was a gastroenterology fellow here at the Cleveland Clinic by the name of Michael Sebeck, a real true endoscopic pioneer. And I very much wanted to emulate how he had approached things. Um, 
in my in, when I was a fellow, I realized that the, the quality of the science in endoscopy wasn't up to up to where I thought it should be. And I read a few articles by uh, a, a, a dear friend of mine, another master endoscopist by the name of Charlie Lightdale, who had done this randomized trial looking at um, the different ways to palliate um, esophageal cancer. And I said, why can't we elevate and amplify the quality of outcomes in endoscopic science? And that really was the that was really the kernel uh, that crystallized why I wanted to become a therapeutic endoscopist. Well, yeah, well, you're certainly a uh... You've moved the needle, that's for sure. It's, it's quite incredible some of the things that you've done. And that was that culminated in your, your presidency of ASG. Yes. That must have been incredible. It is. Um, it is it's, first, it's an honor to lead uh, to help lead a group of that size. It's about 14,000 members. Um, it is a daily sojourn for us. Uh, there's so many things going on. It's exciting. I mean, one of the reasons I enjoy advanced endoscopy is the cutting edge piece but also the iconoclastic piece. We all are taught things, and then some, when you look at it sometimes, where's the evidence behind why what we do? And, and when you can find those holes, and you can put uh, do a study to find data to either dispel the notion or, 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 or say, hey, this is the way we need to do things, it's a, it's a, it's a great accomplishment. Um, all kinds of things going on in endoscopy. Um, we're, we're watching the, the Venn diagram of surgery and endoscopy become closer and closer. And you know, I, I do see in the future where we'll have hybridized training programs. It's, it's, it, I think we are in a unique position with our surgical endoscopists and our, our GI endoscopists to actually lead that, lead that charge. Yeah, I think it's going to be critical moving forward. Right. Right. There's there's so much overlap of the fields, yeah. it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be the same thing. A little thing. bit difficult to negotiate when you think of societies and boards and specialties, we, but, we'll, but we're well positioned. We'll probably have some rotten fruit thrown at us, <laughs> but, but it, you know, if you think about it, any time you have an innovator, there's going to be that, that, that uh, entropy, and then it, 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 makes, it just makes sense. What's the best way to take care of the patient? What's the most efficient way to train our doctors to do what we need to do? And I think these, these walls that have been built over tradition, I mean, technology, I think, has trumped these walls. And we need to, we need to figure out how to, to develop these hybridized programs because it is, again, what's the best thing for the patient? Yeah, and that's, so, what, that's, what we, that's what we do here, Connor, we'll right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So what are your thoughts about quality moving forward when you have a program of this scale? And, you know, maybe moving away a little bit from advanced endoscopy, sure. but thinking more about um, more routine type endoscopy, whether it's colonoscopy or upper or ERCP or what have you. Um, what are your thoughts about how we best assess quality? Something that's meaningful, that it changes an outcome or makes sure an outcome is adequate? Um, well, I guess that's the question. I will take colonoscopy. Uh, we have this currency of adenoma detection rate. That, that, that's fantastic. We've, we've all utilized it as a, a measuring stick. We've used sequel intubation. That's a phenomenal measuring stick. But what we really need to do now is, okay, we're, we're, I think we're all at the level where we want to be. We cannot let complacency be in our lexicon. And I believe the next step will be adequacy of polyp resection. Um, the use of, me, of me, metal clips, when should we be using them? Uh, how should we be using them? Uh, I think these are going to be some of the new quality parameters that we're going to be looking at. I also think, Connor, an area of opportunity for us is uh, we, much, we must get better at describing uh, and documenting the acuity and the complexity of our cases because uh, a simple polypectomy is one thing, but a polyp that's been uh, worked on before with a non-lifting sign in the cecum as you know, it's quite another uh, a, a, quite another kettle of fish for us to deal with. So I think one of the things that we need to work on uh, in, in our electronic medical record is, is, is documentation of acuity, stratifying by that acuity and complexity, and then we can start demonstrating value in an appropriate setting. The ambulatory patient with the, the, with the simple polyp is one area that we can look at in terms of what kind of equipment you're utilizing, et cetera. The other, where you have the non-lifting polyp in the cecum, is quite another. And we're at, at this point, we don't want to have both those types of cases put congealed together because it's just going to confound what we're ultimately after, which is 
high quality colonoscopy, uh, great outcomes, and maximizing value. Yeah, I think value is the key. It's yeah. that quality investment ratio. We've got to we've got to manage it. So the other side of quality, I guess, is the infection control side of yes. quality, and that's something that there's a lot of discussion about at the moment, as you know better than right. anyone. So where do you think that's going to go moving forward, and and how we clean and manage scopes? So it's it's interesting. Um, this is an area that I give Connor that I give thought multiple times during the day um, and night. Actually, is where how do we steer our organization towards the optimal answer? We haven't found the optimal answer. I mean, there, we have we have scopes now. We've demonstrated one thing that's extremely important. There's a human element to to cleaning these complex instruments. The uh, the IFUs for these scopes are hundreds of pages long. Um, it's extremely complicated, and it, I think it's prone to error. So I think the first thing we have to look look at is how do we m minimize that interface or optimize that interface so we can minimize any any issues in terms of perhaps missing a step. And I think the uh, the, the scope companies as well as uh, 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 investigators are looking at that. We are looking at. Duodenoscopes, um, they're very complicated, uh, they're very complex, and one of the things we've learned is that because of their complexity, they're extremely difficult, if not impossible, to, to, to uh, optimally clean. We're now seeing a whole advent of partially disposable uh, pieces on scopes or wholly disposable scopes that are now uh, uh, in, the, in the marketplace. So we have to look at this carefully um, in terms of value, and safety to our patient. And I think we still don't have that answer yet. Um, I think there's expense, there's um, uh, a lot of other issues to think about with disposable scopes, such as what are we, if we're going to use tens of thousands of these things, what are we going to do with all the waste? How are we going to store tens of thousands of scopes? We're going to need a virtual warehouse for this. So there's a lot of things going on at this point. And the other question is, is do we stratify how we use them in our practice? Um, and again, that has medical, ethical, and medical legal uh, issues. So right at this point, what we've done is, is we've optimized how we, we take care of our most complicated scopes. We've also optimized how we take care of our most uncomplicated scopes. Because again, this goes through our entire inventory of, of scopes. We want to be able to, to ensure that we optimize safety for all of our patients. And it will be a, probably an evolutionary process as to how we, in, in a year from now, how do we approach, how do we approach how we clean scopes? An area I'm very interested in is how do we use smaller scopes to look into the channels of the scopes to determine whether there's been optimal cleaning or not, and how can we utilize uh, artificial intelligence to tell us a, a, a red or green diode to say, yeah, it's clean, or no, it's not. Clean it again, and if it's still a red. It needs to go back to the scope manufacturer, so we can simplify the, uh, the the vexing complexity for our scope technicians who are very well versed. But it's a it's a, it's difficult. It sure is. It's sure. very difficult. So, John, the last question in the last minute or so. Um, uh, you mentioned AI. So, what about AI around diagnostics? Uh, yeah. Where where is that space? I know there's some work going on to, uh, into that, particularly in radiology, but also in endoscopy. Right. So, where do you think that's going to end up? I think you're, you're going to see, uh, a, there's commercially available uh, colonoscopy platforms right now for the detection of polyps. Um, the question we have to ask ourselves is that we were, we were seeing all of these platforms being developed. I think we need to come up with a standardized um, methodology for what these, uh, what these AI platforms look like. We need to have a minimum performance standard for them. I believe that they need to be and they need to be scope agnostic, um, and they need to meet these minimum standards uh, throughout the endoscopic endoscopic world: Europe, U.S., Asia. Um, we, they certainly there's studies now that show that certain AI platforms can even outperform master endoscopists in, in, in polyp detection. There was a paper in Gut last year that showed that. So what I see it is, I, I don't see it as autopilot where you and I are up in a plane and we put the plane in the air, we push the button, we let it fly. I, I see it as an adjunct. I think if, if any doctor, any physician who does a procedure or, or a surgery wants to learn to, to optimize their uh, observational abilities. So I see AI as helping us in the training 
of our, our of our uh, train our fellows and residents, and it also helping uh, doctors optimize their their performance standards in terms of maximizing their the, the completeness of their examination as well as finding the pop, finding polyps. The other piece is going to be quality. What I see now is this: if I'm doing a colonoscopy in a couple of hours, um, and I see a polyp, it, it should be able to tell me, okay, Doctor John, that's a. It, it, it should be able to help me with a Paris classification, Kudo pip classification. What's the probability of getting this out? And it may actually, uh, if I can't get it out, maybe it electronically sends a uh, a uh, consultation to you for a right hemicolectomy. There you go. Yeah. So it's 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 actually extremely exciting for us. Um, the other thing is the virtual the virtual consultation. You and I could potentially be called in on virtual consultations right. intraoperatively or intraprocedurally to help or make a, a determination on the next the next move, perhaps in that case. That's very exciting. Yep, we're certainly in an exciting time. A lot of technology, a, a lot of creative thought. John, I'd just like to thank you for your time and your insight. Thank you today. Appreciate, it. appreciate the conversation. Thank okay. you very much. All right.